Sometimes life can be hard, and so can men. The pleasure districts in Edo period Japan could relieve both issues. People saw these places as fantasy lands, the land of milf and honey, inhabited by enchanting women ready to make your desires come true. But where did most of the women who worked in the pleasure houses come from, and how did they live right after they got there? Most arrived as children, girls who were normally around 7 to 9 years old but could be as low as 5. People were actually not a fan of child labor laws. They thought that quality prostitutes were those who grew up in the pleasure district and knew how things worked. Brothels understood that good employees were hard to find, they're better groomed instead. Scouts from the Red Lantern District traveled all over the country looking for candidates, and the main quality they looked for in a candidate was how willing their parents were to sell them. Places recently hit with natural disasters had many quality candidates. Now, people were not just looking to sell off their kids like they were getting rid of the troublesome ones. Yuki, eating cookies before dinner again? Off to the brothel with you. No, but these scouts were slicker than a BP oil spill, able to convince starving peasants and families in debt to hand over their seven-year-old daughters. A scout might open with something like, your daughter would eat the best food. People in cities at the time ate white rice every day. Commoners in the countryside only ate shitty grains, like millet or sometimes brown rice, but beautiful, polished white rice that was like giving steak to a homeless man or virgins to a terrorist. The recruiter might say their daughter would wear better clothes and live in luxury, which was relatively true. Many parents thought prostitution, although shameful, was easier than doing back-breaking work on the family farm. And who knows, some rich city man might buy her out and marry her. As a country gal, meeting a rich city man or samurai was like getting into adult toy collecting. There's no chance unless you move out of your parents' place. Your past evaporated with the wind once you stepped inside the pleasure district. It was pretty much the only way a poor, small-town girl living in a lonely world could lift her status. Many women erased their low-class background by starting a new life in the city. Brothel scouts were bees creating words of honey that dripped into the ears of struggling parents. The thought of their daughters gaining a better life outside of their tiny village of nobodies sounded pretty nice to many poor moms and dads. One weird thing about these recruiters was that they had famously bad memories, often forgetting to mention the bad side of sex work. Being trapped in debt, the pressure to find good clients, having to entertain the douchebag clients, and the physical and mental grind. Parents probably knew that their daughter's life wasn't going to be all sunshine and sushi, but they were comforted by the fact that they needed money and were glad to have one less mouth to feed. Now, what did other people think of parents who flipped their daughters like rare Pokemon cards? Well, Japanese society was all about family. The things you did in life were for the family. If your household fell on hard times, everyone expected you to lend your kids to brothels or other businesses. Pack your bag, Sakura. Poker night didn't go well for daddy. If a man went to court to settle his debts, but the deadbeat did not yet give away his kids or prostitute his wife, it was common for the authorities to give him the side eye. Are you even trying to get your life back together, son? A good daughter was expected to take one for the family. Outsiders didn't look at it with disgust, but with sympathy. For the daughter who did her duty, and the parents who had to send away their child. Parents loved their daughters and appreciated the sacrifice. They felt sad, but it was more like the sadness of parents whose child moved out or went off to college. It was sad to separate. It wasn't the, oh my god, I just sent my little princess to assault land Japan type of sadness, usually. Upon entering the pleasure house, the girl became a kamuro, a young servant to courtesans. Courtesan meant high-ranking prostitute. The girl was given a new name and handed to a courtesan, who she called sister. Courtesans had flowery names like Yugiri, which means evening mist, but Kamuro names were more innocent. Courtesans could have one to three Kamuro each. For those with two or more, their Kamuro had related names like Onami and Menami, Big Wave and Little Wave, or Ukon and Sakon, Right Guard and Left Guard. It could be a line of poetry like Fujino and Takane, which meant the high summit of Mount Fuji. I can't find jelly anywhere. Oh, probably off somewhere with peanut butter again. Those two always sticking together. Kamuro only attended to their sister courtesans, bringing them food or running errands. They did not see customers, they were too young. But the sister's job was to mentor her Kamuro on the ways of the pleasure quarters. 
The pleasure house paid for Ikamuro's housing and food, but her courtesan paid for everything else, taking care of her like a younger sister. Most courtesans really did seem to care about their Kamuro. Plus, for a courtesan, having a well-behaved Kamuro was like having Instagram posts about how great your boyfriend is. It makes you look better, even though you're stuck every night sleeping with a guy you feel nothing for. Kamuro slept in rooms next to their big sisters. They ate and played with other Kamuro in their free time. These girls were vital to a courtesan's business. Courtesans sometimes did little parades around town, and the girls were nice little accessories, like diamond jewelry. They made for great status symbols and existed via the exploitation of children. Plus, the girls were supposed to round out the vibe with a little playfulness and innocence. A courtesan was often busy seeing patrons and busier being inaccessible. She was a woman who played symphonies with your flute and made you pay for the show. She couldn't be seen out and about picking up her dry cleaning like some common hoe, but her kamuro could run down those streets like diarrhea. They carried letters and gifts between a courtesan and her clients. They were seen in town more often, so they were perfect messengers. Clients prowled around these kamuro like horny, thirsty tigers, always asking her about her sister to get clues on how to win the courtesan's heart. AR-15s are great, but a child's innocence is a better weapon. These girls would answer questions in ways that benefited their sisters. Sometimes clueless patrons would even ask them to spy on their sisters, which never turned out well for the patrons. Kamuro had little tricks. Sometimes you'd have a patron who wanted to keep his name secret. A Kamuro would run up to him, cling to his arm, and call him by the wrong name. An unsuspecting man might accidentally correct her and leak his true name. A courtesan couldn't be caught dead begging a client to come see her, but her Kamuro had no problem busting out her puppy dog eyes and tugging on his sleeves, begging and whining for him to come see her sister, playing his heartstrings like a shamisen. They were the eyes and ears of high-ranking prostitutes, running around town spying on people, listening to rumors, and catching cheating clients, because it was in the rules of the pleasure district that a client could only see one courtesan at a time. These girls probably grew up quickly after being tossed into a world of relationships and sex at a young age, learning life lessons faster than winning the lottery. All Kamuro had the potential to become prostitutes one day. Brothel owners always kept one eye out for any Kamuro with looks and brains, and kept the other eye out for dumb, ugly ones. These latter unfortunate girls, or fortunate, would do child manual labor for the rest of their contracts. The ones who showed promise were taught a courtesan education, which consisted of some cultural knowledge, some musical skills, and a hundred ways to cope with suicidal thoughts. They also went through a crash course on sex education, not about bedroom techniques, but about the ancient courtesan art of manipulating men, useful in the pleasure business and in life. Thirteen or fourteen was the age that a Kamuro graduated, and the graduation ceremony was a doozy. But first, why this age? The answer has to do with contracts, which doesn't sound that interesting, until you find out that they're contracts for buying and selling humans. Initially, when a brothel recruiter went up to a house in the slums recently hit by smallpox and knocked on the owner's poverty asking for his daughter, he would present the owner with a hiring contract. Signing it meant his daughter would be a live-in employee of the brothel. At 13 or 14, when the girl was set to leave her Kamuro status, the brothel would invite her folks over for a cup of tea and a side of ownership contracts. This new agreement was not just another hiring contract, the brothel wanted to buy the girl. Buying her now, rather than in the beginning, was a good idea because avocados. When you first buy an avocado, it's hard to tell when it will ripen. Now that the girl was 13 or 14, they had a better idea how much she was worth, and it was nearing the time her contract expired anyways. The pleasure house offered the parents some money, called money for the body. How much depended on her beauty and accomplishments. Most parents just took the money and said ganbate to their daughter. Good luck honey, you mean so much to us, about 30 silver coins. Granted, those were terrible parents, because they had no idea how to negotiate a good price. Smart parents contacted a professional to estimate the girl's value. If the brothel offered too low a price, the parents could refuse and take her back home where she belonged, then go sell her to another establishment who knew how much their precious daughter was worth. Parents had a lot of leverage because the brothel had already fed and trained her for years. They would hate to throw all that away and lose her to a rival. Brothel owners knew this could happen, so often they would avoid the risk and buy the girl from the beginning. 
When a promising girl reached about 13 or 14, she left her kamuro life. She was promoted to anywhere from a low-level prostitute to a high-ranking courtesan, depending on her looks and skills. The girls were probably not fully aware of the hardships of courtesan life, and likely didn't know that people outside the quarters saw their work as undesirable. They were chomping at the tit to live that glamorous courtesan life when they grew up, looking forward to wearing fancy clothing, receiving gifts, and being loved and pursued by men who ate sushi with gold foil. The graduation ceremony was called Mizuage. Ten days before the ceremony, the graduate blackened her teeth for the first time by collecting the substance called ohaguro from seven friends of her courtesan. It was the beginning of her journey into adulthood. On the big day, a soba noodle dish was served to the residents of the brothel. The brothel also sent a gift of soba, or rice boiled with red beans, to every adult-related businesses they were friendly with. Friends of the house dropped by. It was like a college party, and people upstairs are getting assaulted. Each person received a little gift, like some cloth, a fan, or a towel. The more attractive kamuro got fancier and more expensive ceremonies. For about a week after, the graduate paraded down the streets every day dressed in a different outfit to float her name across the pleasure district like a cherry blossom petal that falls on fat money pouches. Her friends and other courtesans sent gifts and money her way. Often the entire ceremony would be paid for by a rich patron, or sometimes a poor one. It's sad that there were men who would bankrupt themselves to please these ladies of pleasure. On the bright side, they would be supplying more workers to the profession they enjoyed. It was important for a kamuro to stay a virgin until she came of age. Many businesses wanted their young girls to stay innocent and enjoy their childhood, but not these businesses. Pleasure houses kept their kamuro's virginity under lock and key so they could auction it off at a price that would make a man sell his daughter into a pleasure house. There were cases of pregnant kamuro, but most of those were because she fooled around with a boy co-worker rather than with a client. There were also cases of a kamuro's virginity being sold multiple times. If you're confused, then you're probably not the right type of client. It grows back, honest. Actually, there was an air of innocence around Kamuro. People saw them as playful, living life sheltered like children because they were. Everyone cherished them and they were spoiled like rotten apples. Right after her Mizuage ceremony, that innocence still hung in the air about her. One writer called a Kamuro a little mouse who does not yet know the claws of a cat. Someone needs to check his computer. After the ceremony, a top-tiered kamuro could become a high-ranking courtesan, but more often became shinzo. Shinzo were like a upgraded kamuro. They were still assigned to courtesans as servants. Early in the Edo period, shinzo could not sleep with clients because they might steal clients from the courtesans. But eventually, people got tired of that rule, and shinzo saw men on their own, becoming low- or mid-level sex workers. Most stayed at the shinzo rank for the rest of their careers. There were many other types of sex workers in the pleasure quarters, like bathhouse women who helped you bathe in a totally innocent way. Click here to learn about them and the other women of the Japanese pleasure district. We have some new patrons on Patreon today. Ava M., Leah Johnson, Ankita Gosh, Anina Shaurendra, Riley Potts, and KB. Thank you so much. Alright, I love you and spread the knowledge.